The Human Cycle by Sri Aurobindo Chapter 2 The Age of Individualism and Reason Therefore, on every individualistic age of mankind, there is imperative the search for two supreme desiderata. It must find a general standard of truth to which the individual judgment of all will be inwardly compelled to subscribe without physical constraint or imposition of irrational authority. And it must reach to some principle of social order which shall be equally founded on a universally recognizable truth of things. An order is needed that will put a rein on desire and interest by providing at least some intellectual and moral test which these two powerful and dangerous forces must satisfy before they can feel justified in asserting their claims on life. Speculative and scientific reason for their means, the pursuit of a practicable social justice and sound utility for their spirit. The progressive nations of Europe set out on their search for this light and this law. They found and held it with enthusiasm in the discoveries of physical science, the triumphant domination, the all-shattering and irresistible victory of science in the 19th century Europe, is explained by the absolute perfection with which it at least seemed for a time to satisfy these great psychological wants of the Western mind. Science seemed to it to fulfill impeccably its search for the two supreme desiderata of an individualistic age. Here, at last, was a truth of things which depended on no doubtful scripture or fallible human authority, but which Mother Nature herself had written in her eternal book for all to read who had patience to observe, and intellectual honesty to judge. Here were laws, principles, fundamental facts of the world and of our being, which all could verify at once for themselves, and which must therefore satisfy and guide the free individual judgment, delivering it equally from alien compulsion, and from erratic self-will. Here were laws and truths which justified and yet controlled the claims and desires of the individual human being. Here is science which provided a standard, a norm of knowledge, a rational basis for life, a clear outline and sovereign means for the progress and perfection of the individual and the race. The attempt to govern and organize human life by verifiable science, by a law, a truth of things, an order and principles which all can observe and verify in their ground and fact, and to which therefore all may freely and must rationally subscribe, is the culminating movement of European civilization. It has been the fulfillment and triumph of the individualistic age of human society. It has seemed likely also to be its end, the cause of the death of individualism, and its putting away 
and burial among the monuments of the past. For this discovery by individual free thought of universal laws, of which the individual is almost a byproduct, and by which he must necessarily be governed, this attempt actually to govern the social life of humanity in conscious accordance with the mechanism of these laws seems to lead logically to the suppression of that very individual freedom which made the discovery and the attempt at all possible. In seeking the truth and law of his own being, the individual seems to have discovered a truth and law which is not of his own individual being at all, but of the collectivity, the pack, the hive, the mass. The result to which this points, and to which it still seems irresistibly to be driving us, is a new ordering of society by a rigid economic or governmental socialism in which the individual, deprived again of his freedom in his own interest and that of humanity, must have his whole life and action determined for him at every step and in every point from birth to old age by the well-ordered mechanism of the state. There is a footnote here. We already see a violent, though incomplete, beginning of this line of social evolution in fascist Italy, Nazi Germany, communist Russia. The trend is for more and more nations to accept this beginning of a new order, and the resistance of the old order is more passive than active. It lacks the fire, enthusiasm, and self-confidence which animates the innovating idea. End of the footnote. We might, then, have a curious new version, with very important differences of the old Asiatic or even of the old Indian order of society. In place of the religio-ethical sanction, there will be a scientific and rational or naturalistic motive and rule. Instead of the Brahmin Shastrakara, the scientific, administrative, and economic expert. In the place of the king himself, observing the law and compelling with the aid and consent of society, all to tread without deviation, the line marked out for them, the line of the Dharma, there will stand the collectivist state, similarly guided and empowered. Instead of a hierarchical arrangement of classes, each with its powers, privileges, and duties, there will be established an initial equality of education and opportunity, ultimately perhaps with the subsequent determination of function by experts who shall know us better than ourselves and choose for us our work and quality. Marriage, generation, and the education of the child may be fixed by the scientific state as of old by the Shastra. For each man there will be a long stage of work for the state, superintended by collectivist authorities, and perhaps in the end a period of liberation, not for action, but for enjoyment of leisure and personal self-improvement, answering to the vanaprastha 
and sannyasa ashramas of the old Aryan society. The rigidity of such a social state would greatly surpass that of its Asiatic forerunners. For there, at least, there were for the rebel, the innovator, two important concessions. There was for the individual the freedom of an early sannyasa, a renunciation of the social for the free spiritual life. And there was for the group the liberty to form a sub-society governed by new conceptions like the Sikh or the Vaishnava. But neither of these violent departures from the norm could be tolerated by a strictly economic and rigorously scientific and unitarian society. Obviously, too, there would grow up a fixed system of social morality and custom, and a body of socialistic doctrine which one could not be allowed to question practically, and perhaps not even intellectually, since that would soon shatter or undermine the system. Thus, we should have a new typal order, based upon purely economic capacity and function, gunya karma, and rapidly petrifying by the inhibition of individual liberty into a system of rationalistic conventions. And quite certainly, this static order would at long last be broken by a new individualist age of revolt, led probably by the principles of an extreme philosophical anarchism. On the other hand, there are in operation forces which seem likely to frustrate or modify this development before it can reach its menaced consummation. In the first place, rationalistic and physical science has overpassed itself and must, before long, be overtaken by a mounting flood of psychological and psychic knowledge, which cannot fail to compel quite a new view of the human being and open a new vista before mankind. At the same time, the age of reason is visibly drawing to an end. Novel ideas are sweeping over the world and are being accepted with a significant rapidity. Ideas inevitably subversive of any premature typal order of economic rationalism. Dynamic ideas such as Nietzsche's will to live, Bergson's exaltation of intuition above intellect, or the latest German philosophical tendency to acknowledge a suprarational faculty and a suprarational order of truths. Already, another mental poise is beginning to settle and conceptions are on the way to apply themselves in the field of practice, which promise to give the succession of the individualistic age of society, not to a new typal order, but to a subjective age, which may well be a great and momentous passage to a very different goal. It may be doubted whether we are not already in the morning twilight of a new period of the human cycle. Secondly, the West, in its triumphant conquest of the world, has awakened the slumbering East and has produced in its midst an increasing struggle between an imported Western individualism and the old conventional principle of society. The latter is here rapidly, there slowly breaking down. 
But something quite different from Western individualism may very well take its place. Some opine, indeed, that Asia will reproduce Europe's age of reason with all its materialism and secularist individualism, while Europe itself is pushing onward to new forms and ideas. But this is, in the last degree, improbable. On the contrary, the signs are that the individualistic period in the East will be neither of long duration nor predominantly rationalistic and secularist in its character. If then the East, as the result of its awakening, follows its own bent and evolves a novel social tendency and culture that is bound to have an enormous effect on the direction of the world's civilization, we can measure its probable influence by the profound results of the first reflux of the ideas, even of the unawakened East, upon Europe. Whatever that effect may be, it will not be in favor of any reordering of society on the lines of the still current tendency towards a mechanical economism which has not ceased to dominate mind and life in the Occident. The influence of the East is likely to be rather in the direction of subjectivism and practical spirituality. A greater opening of our physical existence to the realization of ideals other than the strong but limited aims suggested by the life and the body in their own gross nature. But most important of all, the individualistic age of Europe has, in its discovery of the individual, fixed among the idea forces of the future two of a master potency which cannot be entirely eliminated by any temporary reaction. The first of these, now universally accepted, is the democratic conception of the right of all individuals as members of the society to the full life and the full development of which they are individually capable. It is no longer possible that we should accept as an ideal any arrangement by which certain classes of society should arrogate development and full social function to themselves while assigning a bare and barren function of service alone to others. It is now fixed that social development and well-being mean the development and well-being of all the individuals in the society and not merely a flourishing of the community in the mass which resolves itself really into the splendor and power of one or two classes. This conception has been accepted in full by all progressive nations and is the basis of the present socialistic tendency of the world. But in addition... There is this deeper truth which individualism has discovered, that the individual is not merely a social unit. His existence, his right, and claim to live and grow are not founded solely on his social work and function. He is not merely a member of a human pack, hive, or anthill, he is something in himself, a soul, a being, who has to fulfill his own individual truth and law, as well as his natural or his assigned part in the truth and law of the collective 
existence. And there is a footnote here. This is no longer recognized by the new order, fascist or communistic. Here the individual is reduced to a cell or atom of the social body. We have destroyed, proclaims a German exponent, the false view that men are individual beings. There is no liberty of individuals. There is only liberty of nations or races. Back to the text. He demands freedom, space, initiative for his soul, for his nature, for that puissant and tremendous thing which society so much distrusts and has labored in the past either to suppress altogether or to relegate to the purely spiritual field an individual thought, will, and conscience. If he is to merge these eventually, it cannot be into the dominating thought, will, and conscience of others, but into something beyond, into which he and all must be both allowed and helped freely to grow. That is an idea, a truth, which, intellectually recognized, and given its full exterior and superficial significance by Europe, agrees at its root with the profoundest and highest spiritual conceptions of Asia, and has a large part to play in the molding of the future. Namaste.